So I'm going to begin with some good news. And the good news is that there is a high probability that this century, human population growth is going to plateau. It's not certain. We have to make difficult decisions over the next couple of decades. But humanity's footprint on the Earth could conceivably come to a plateau. But there will be more people, and those people will not only consume more food, but they will demand, and they will rightfully demand, more food and better food. And so we're going to see a radical change in the food system. In part, the food system will go backwards to a time, it never went away in China, but go backwards to a time when governments really were concerned all the time about food. But we're also going to see a time where there'll be increasing pressures on the food system. We're hitting planetary boundaries when it comes to water, when it comes to phosphate. And the old joke is they don't make land anymore. And all these challenges are going to happen at the same time as the effects of climate change will become ever more apparent. We're going to see greater production shocks, those shocks will be more severe, and they'll occur over a larger geographical area. So we're going to see a disruptive time in the food system, a disruptive time which will both have challenges, but it will also have opportunities. I want to touch on three areas, and the first is production. Well, in the past, when we need more food, we converted land, such as this lovely rainforest in Sabah, into agricultural land. The best way to get carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is to drain swamps or cut down forests. Any sensible policy, there is no new land for agriculture. A massive amount can be done by closing the yield gap, by improving education, the human social capital, and the infrastructure, an area where China has made extraordinary progress over the last couple of decades. And we also have to invest in new knowledge. We have to invest not only in closing the yield gap, but increasing yields. There's a lot that can be done, but I'd argue that perhaps our focus on what we're investing at the moment has been a little narrow. And when we think about how we're going to invest in new knowledge, we have to get away from the traditional agriculturalist view that we need to have just bigger corns, fatter cattle, we have to think about a really much more complex set of instructions, uh, a set of objectives. The way we produce food at the moment is literally unsustainable. We have to farm in a really new way. Yes, we have to intensify, but the watchword must be sustainable intensification, which is not an oxymoron. It's the prime goal of agricultural research. But it's not just production. It's the way we govern the food system. Now, some people argue that the fact that food is a globally traded commodity is a disaster. I think that's wrong. I think we have to make globalization work in favor of food security. As I said, we're going to see larger production shocks. We need to see grain baskets able to compensate for problems in different areas. And we need to do that in a way that uh, doesn't penalize the very poorest countries that are not yet ready to be part of a globalized food system. Agriculture can be such an important engine of development at the very low level. And we have to get away from some of the ways that we support agricultural and rural economies in the rich world, which are obscenely affect, distort food prices in the way that particularly affects the poorest parts of the world. And the world is so different today. So many of the bottom billion live in big mega cities, such as Lagos in the picture here. And in Lagos, the cost of food on the ground is intimately connected with global world food prices. If we get global food prices wrong, then people in these big me mega cities will starve. And finally, and the question I'm going to ask at the end, I want to talk about individual decisions. I don't believe we can produce enough food and govern it well to solve all problems. We have to take hard decisions ourselves about the way we waste food. A third of all food we grow is wasted. A lot of it is wasted in the home. And this cartoon shows how diets have gone in the West and are likely to go in the emerging countries. It's not a question of making decisions that are rational ourselves and irrational overall. It's irrational for us to eat the type of diet we're doing. It's making us ill and it's putting an enormous pressure on the environment. In this last slide, if we get everything wrong, then we're going to see the type of civil disturbance that in these pictures here were the precursor to the Arab Spring. So the question I want to end up with 
is how do we make decisions about diets? Changing diets is one of the ways we need to cope with food security. How do we make decisions that, even though rational, we don't make ourselves, and how do we make them collectively? And I hope at least some of you will come and join me to debate these at the end. Thank you.